Good afternoon, everyone. I am Lindsay St. Arnold Bell, Associate Director at Near West Side Partners. Welcome to our weekly Wednesday webinar. Uh, this week, we're really excited to share um, some updates on our Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grant. And we have a great team joining us. As we uh, get our PowerPoint loaded and our slideshows ready, um, I do want to just give a quick rundown of what you can expect over uh, the course of the next hour or so. Um, we will be beginning with a short introduction uh, about the Choice Neighborhood Initiative um, Planning Grant and Implementation Grant. Um, following that, we will be hearing from Murphy Antoine from Tordy Gallus. Uh, Murphy and his team are here to talk about um, our housing strategies for the implementation grant. Following that, we will hear from Ken Barbo from HACA, the Housing Authority of the City of Milwaukee, who will really be talking about the people aspects of our planning grant. So that would include relocation of public housing residents and some of the supportive activities that go into these kinds of grants. Um, and then Anna Weirich from the Near West Side Partner team will be joining us uh, to talk about the neighborhood aspects. You will have to forgive me, my little dog might make an appearance too. Um, if we could go to the next slide. At the very end of our program, um, there will be some time for questions and comments. Um, so as we're moving along, if you have a question or a comment, please plug it into the chat and we will um, answer those. If you're watching us live on Facebook, you can put your questions and comments in the chat there as well. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm Lindsay St. Arnold, Associate Director of Near West Side Partners. Next slide. And I'm sure many watching today are familiar with the work that Near West Side Partners has done along with Marquette University and Hackham on the Choice Neighborhood Planning Grant. Today we're talking about our Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grant application. And you know, the Choice Neighborhood Program really focuses on how to redevelop a neighborhood um, through three um, key elements. First being housing. Um, so really looking at how you can um, transform public housing to better serve the residents that live there. Um, the next is people. So um, how, how do neighborhoods support the people and, and what supportive services are available, not just for public housing residents, but for all residents in the neighborhood. And finally, let's look at the neighborhood as a whole. What kinds of goods and amenities are needed to make this a kind of community that is thriving and attractive to the people who live here and work here? Next slide, please. Uh, so the Choice Implementation Grant is kind of like the second step of um, the planning process. So we came together over the course of the last two years to create a transformation plan. This implementation grant is kind of like putting that plan to work. So over the course of the next uh, six to eight months, uh, we can expect to see um, the housing, uh, excuse me, HUD, um, federal HUD, issue up to five Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grants. Those grants are up to $35 million. And a portion of that grant um, can be used to um, support the people side of things. So those are the supportive services, um, the physical improvements to the neighborhood. So that's that neighborhood realm. And then the, the largest part of the grant goes to revitalizing and transforming housing in the neighborhood, including public housing. Next slide, please. Um, the grant application will be due in mid-December, uh, December 16th, and Near West Side Partners is working closely with the City of Milwaukee and the Housing Authority, among other partners, to meet that deadline. We would expect that finalists will be announced in early spring with the final awards announced in May or June of 2021. Next slide. And so just to give an idea of the, the team and the stakeholders, the, the folks who are working to make this application come together, um, the team is really led by the City of Milwaukee and the Housing Authority, HACM. 
Uh, Near Westside Partners and our anchor institutions are also supporting the application. Um, particularly Marquette University, they've done so much work as part of the planning grant, um, but all of the, the other anchor institutions as well, and the Redevelopment Authority. And our key stakeholders, these are the folks that really influence the application and help us help to inform the, 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 the various aspects of the application. It includes Near West Side residents, uh, residents of College Court and other public housing, uh, citizens of Milwaukee, our advisory councils, the public schools, and other nonprofit organizations and businesses in the area. Next slide. Um, you know, much like our planning grant, this is a community based approach to community development and housing development. So anybody who has been part of our the development of our transfer, transformation plan would be familiar with the various uh, meetings we've had, focus groups, surveys that we've administered to collect information about what people want to see in the neighborhood, not just uh, you know, the kinds of assets and amenities that make their neighborhood important, but um, the, the changes to housing and, and what services they need to really kind of live their best lives here in the near west side. Um, you know, we listen, we document, and uh, we work together to form a consensus. And all of that work really um, comes together in the development of not just the transformation plan, but then further informs our application for the implementation grant. Next. Okay, so today I'd like to introduce Murphy Antoine. He is from Torty Gallus, and he will be talking about the housing section of the implementation grant. Great, Murphy. thank you, Lindsay. Um, wonderful introduction to Choice Neighborhoods. I'm sure a lot of the folks uh, here today have, have heard a lot about that. Again, I'm Murphy Antoine. I'm an architect and planner with Torty Gallus and Partners, and we are part of the team uh, putting together the physical aspects of the housing strategy uh, for the Choice Neighborhoods implementation. I've got a other, couple other folks uh, here from, from my team, uh, Brian and Dave and Molly from Torty Gallus, uh, some of your neighbors um, at Quorum Architects, uh, Allison Mimic and, and her team, uh, were all the, the other part of the housing strategy, physical housing strategy team uh, includes folks like the Communities Group, um, EUA, another architecture, Milwaukee-based architecture firm, and, and, and others. Um, again, in talking about the, uh, the housing strategy, we're talking about sticks and bricks for housing, uh, new construction, housing renovation, improved in the near west side. And this is a large boundary, as you know, for the neighborhood uh, that defines the near west side. For the implementation grant purposes, um, the boundary that you see here is, uh, is defined by Vliet Street to the north, um, by I-94 roughly to the south, by I-43 roughly to the east, and by 175 to the west. So it is a pretty extensive geography, and I think you can get a sense of that uh, from the map. And, the, and that geography has certain strengths and it has uh, certain challenges. Uh, but again, it's a big area and, uh, and, and we talked about the boundaries. If you thought about the center of it, we're thinking of Highland and 27th as sort of the geographic center of that, uh, of that neighborhood, which gives you a sense of, of kind of the, the quadrants. Um, certainly the, the, one of the biggest strengths of this area are the um, are is its residents the people that live there and the anchor institutions that make their homes there um, uh, uh, chief among them marquette university uh, but also advocate aurora miller coors harley davidson the forest county potawatomi all of these anchor institutions that have been part of near west sides efforts um, ongoing uh, for, for many years which is another strength of the neighborhood the ongoing efforts uh, that Near West Side has made prior to the planning grant. And then um, I would say, at least from my observation, um, accelerated during the last couple of years of the, the planning grant transformation plan. 
um, and then the, the great educational um, institutions and excellence represented by Marquette, represented by Milwaukee Academy of Sciences and many other schools uh, in the neighborhood. The, these are strengths of the area. And then the, the, some of the, the challenges might be um, leveraging the resources and partnerships across that geography just because it is such a big area. Where do you make um, strategic uh, impacts that, all, that have ripple effects throughout the larger area? And then fitting that into what I'll call the pretty specific choice neighborhoods uh, boxes that HUD gives you. Check the box. This is how we like to see it. This is what we mean by this. And, and getting the goals uh, that are very specific to the, the neighbors and you that live there to work in, the, in what HUD is expecting so that we can secure the grants is, is one of the things that we all, always keep in mind. And then doing that on a, on a compressed time, time frame that fits in with the planning grant uh, transformation plan. Uh, the other thing you'll see on this two, uh, on this map, and if we actually go to the second one, are the two target sites. And this, when we come down to, again, sticks and bricks of housing strategy, are two um, low-income housing sites that, that are the focus that, uh, that lets you in the door with HUD. One is College Court that we know, uh, around 35th and Highland, which are, are two 13-story towers of senior apartments, all one bedroom apartments, and there are roughly 250 of those, 251 to be, to be precise. Again, all senior apartments. HUD in its choice neighborhoods world likes to see an impact on family units as well uh, and see that as part of, a, of an effective transformation plan. So we have incorporated Meadow Village, which you may know up around uh, 17th and Vleet as a 90 apartment uh, family uh, development, also um, affordable low income housing that includes two bedrooms, three bedrooms, four bedrooms, um, even some planned five bedrooms uh, that, that uh, is really a family unit. There are 90 there, 251 at, uh, at College Court. I'm gonna do some quick math here because Choice Neighborhoods Housing Strategy wants to see each one of those um, very low income senior and family apartments uh, and units and homes come back. So that's driving the replacement of 351 homes. Uh, Choice Neighborhoods also doesn't want to see a concentrated very low income. So it would like to see those replacement plus a workforce income level housing program, plus a market rate income housing program, which essentially doubles that 341 unit math that I uh, just spoke of. So what, what does that mean? That means in this map that you're looking at that outlines College Court and Meadow Village, we're also looking at many other housing opportunities in the near west side to both replace that 341 um, homes and add this workforce and market rate uh, component. And, and we all know that there are many sites, many developments uh, for renovation uh, that, uh, that, that can address that. And we'll talk about uh, some of those in particular if we could go to the next slide. College Court is the, is the first one. Again, I uh, described it a little bit, but it's the, the two 13-story senior towers, again, Highland and, and 35th. And what are some of the challenges there uh, that, that, would get a, that need to be addressed? And this goes back to conversations that I at least have had since 2017 um, with Hackam and the residents at, at College Court, and I know they go further back. Uh, than that, but the, there's a, uh, a, a population that needs handicapped accessible units and mobility impaired units, and these older apartments at College Court don't really meet them. You can also see from the aerial or the map that we see in the upper left that there's not a lot of open space on College Court, so how can we introduce um, some, some uh, park area, which is also a, a, um, 
a goal of the entire uh, near west side neighborhood. Um, older systems for air conditioning, heating, plumbing, uh, need to need to be addressed, and some of the uh, the exterior materials have also uh, reached an age where they need to be replaced. So these are some of the challenges at College Court, and one of the other challenges I'll say is how to um, to, to to maybe better uh, fit in with the near west side as a whole. So the density, the the size of these buildings really sticks out uh, com compared to its neighbors. If we go to the next slide. You can see some of the things that we're thinking about here in the current plan for choice neighborhoods, which would take down both towers, take down the 251 units and replace them with 112, call it 110 to 120, both one bedroom and two bedroom apartments, introduce um, some amenity space, so places for community rooms, places for services uh, that the residents don't don't have right now, and uh, and that and, and at a four-story building that is more in scale and in keeping with the surrounding neighborhood. Now again, you see that call it 110, 120 units at a new college court. That means. Again, we have to replace the rest of the units that were displaced here, the 251 minus the 120. So there's 130 we have to make up in some of these other sites. Plus, again, the, the um, mixed income component of workforce housing and market rate housing. If we go to the next uh, target site, you can see Meadow Village. And this is, as I described earlier, a 90 apartment of, of two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom um, homes that is currently being renovated as of uh, almost a month ago, I would say. Uh, the improvements are already starting to be made uh, to this development. We're meeting with the residents of Meadow Village specifically uh, this evening, uh, but, but these units are replaced in kind. And what does that mean? That means that the 90 units that are here today are being renovated and will result in 90 improved units. So it's not the same math challenge as College Court where we're reducing the count on site, but it does introduce this need for, well, you've got 90 lower income here, where do the equivalent um, other 91 of, uh, of workforce and mixed income come, come into play. But you can see, get a sense for uh, what Meadow Village is, uh, is like, again, from the aerial and the photos, and I'm sure you know it um, as, a, as a neighbor. If we go to the next slide, you can see some of the other areas. Um, if you remember back a few slides to that larger map that identifies what we're calling clusters of additional housing opportunity to make up some of that replacement um, uh, program from College Court, the 130 or so that are the difference between 251 existing and the and the replacement. Um, so, so where did the rest of the replacement go? Where does the workforce go? Where does the market go? We think there are a series of opportunities around State Street and 23rd, call it the city on a hill campus, uh, but it's made up of a parking lot that perhaps you replace that parking, but redevelop that for, um, for family uh, housing. Uh, Milwaukee Academy of Sciences has, uh, but call it the top half of the building that would never, that, that is not anticipated to ever be used for the school is there an introduction of housing that could happen there? And are there some synergies with the neighborhood and with um, families that might live in that housing um, and, and to be associated with the, the school and the school activities? There's all, there are also the uh, Kilbourne lofts. Um, so this, we think this is an area where some of that additional housing strategy can be concentrated in some ways, um, but also make an impact um, immediately and felt throughout the larger near west side. Another uh, cluster, another area or series of areas that we're looking at, if we go to the next slide, is um, along Wisconsin around 28th and also Kilbourne in between, call it 26th and 29th. There are a series 
of opportunities there. And again, this is um, one of the goals of Choice Neighborhoods. Again, have a, have a concentrated housing impact, but also impact throughout the neighborhood. And I'll say we're very excited about this plan that has not one or two, but a whole series of other developments beyond College Court, beyond Meadow Village, that can really make the impact throughout the larger near west side. And we've done a lot of choice neighborhoods. We've done a lot of, uh, um, uh, including West Lawn Gardens with, uh, with Hackham up in the northwest part of the city. But this one, I think, uh, has the opportunity to be um, one of the most comprehensive because of that, uh, that kind of impact in, in multiple different uh, places. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Ken Barbeau from, uh, from Hackham to talk about the people side of Choice Neighborhoods. Thank you, Murphy. Um, so one of the advantages to the Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grant um, is that it, it not only helps to transform the, the housing, uh, the buildings, as, as, as Murphy mentioned, but also it allows funding to help um, folks towards their goals, to help our residents towards their goals and uh, really uh, help transform the lives of the people who live in these assisted housing properties. So the two targeted properties, as Murphy mentioned, is College Court uh, and Meadow Village. And so um, we are going to be using this Choice Neighborhood Implementation Money to help um, individuals prepare um, some development plans for themselves and, and, and get to where they want to be. Um, the first thing, go to the next slide. The first thing we want to work on is relocation. And as anybody who's had to move knows, that's a really stressful time for, for individuals. You know, we work under, the federal government um, has a series of rules called the Uniform Relocation Act. And, and we've done relocation a number of times. We really, um, sit down with each resident, we work one-on-one -on -one with them, and talk them through the relocation options. Um, and so, because as you know, we're going to be tearing down College Court and rebuilding there and in other locations in the neighborhood, people will have to move out of their apartments for a period of maybe one, two years. And so, um, what, what we want to do is talk them through their relocation options. Now that may include, um, we may have vacant apartments in some of our other public housing high rises that we would offer them. Um, another option is using a rent assistance voucher. People know this as the Section 8 Rent Assistance Program uh, or the Housing Choice Voucher Program. And that they can use to rent a mark, a, uh, an apartment in the private market um, in the neighborhood or wherever they want to use it in. Um, we, you know, work closely with them. We provide them leads on where there may be apartments in areas that they're looking at. Um, and we really help them through that process. We have a relocation coordinator that works one-on-one -on -one with each resident. Um, we also provide all the moving supplies, um, boxes, tape. Um, and if somebody is unable to pack their boxes, we actually, you know, have the movers that we will hire um, do the packing for them if somebody is elderly and cannot do that. So we provide the supplies, we hire moving companies, we pay for the moving costs both out of College Court to wherever they're relocating temporarily to, and if they want to return to College Court, um, we pay for that move back as well. And the cost that we uh, pay for also includes any other additional costs that a resident might incur, like if they had cable service and there's a re uh, reconnection fee to reestablish it at a different address, we would pay that as well. So we, we work with the residents. We want to make sure that they're comfortable uh, in the move. They understand what's happening and we assist them along the way. Next slide. The same thing happens when uh, we're talking about reoccupancy or returning to College Court. Uh, under the Choice Neighborhood Grant, all residents have a right to return to a renovated replacement unit, um, whether it's in College Court or one of these close by uh, buildings, since we're reducing the number of apartments at that one site. 
Um, they have the right to return to a replacement unit right there, uh, provided they're compliant with the lease terms. And that's the, really the only requirement. Uh, so as long as they continue to pay their rent and they're compliant with their lease, they have the right to return. Accessible units uh, are going to be built as part of this, as, as Murphy mentioned. Those are prioritized for those who need an accessibility accommodation. And so for folks who are in wheelchairs or scooters or who really have that need for that accessibility. Um, we can't promise our residents that they're gonna to return to the exact same location at College Court. About 110 or 120 of them will be able to. Um, but there's other replacement units that are gonna be renovated close by in the near west side um, as the housing uh, plan described. And so they may be uh, located there. So, but they do have the right to return. Next slide. Similar to College Court, Meadow Village also um, is doing relocation. Now, because they all are already working under a low income housing tax credit grant, um, they're already started on some of these renovations that they're doing. And their renovate relocation plan is a lot simpler because they're not tearing down these units. They are just renovating these units. And so um, their plan uh, has been to keep as many residents as possible on site. They move them to a vacant apartment during the renovations. They move their furniture with them. And then um, they're out for about 45 days or so. And then they move them back to their original apartment. And Meadow Village pays for all the moves and for any other associated costs uh, regarding the relocation. And so uh, it's a little short, more of a short term re relocation and they're kept on site. Uh, and uh, so it's a little easier on the residents that way. Next slide. Similar with reoccupancy, the residents have the right to, to uh, remain, to return to their renovated apartment provide they're compliant with their lease terms. Um, and it's exactly the same as, as what I described before. Most folks at Meadow Village will return to the exact same apartment that they were in to begin with. Next slide. There's also a program that HUD calls, it's a, it's a re uh, requirement, a regulation called Section 3. And that was uh, put in place in the late 60s. Uh, it has to do with uh, employment and training opportunities for low-income individuals and uh, also contracting opportunities for businesses that employ low-income individuals. And so they have set goals um, of how many new hires should be low-income individuals and uh, what percentage of subcontracts have to go to Section 3 businesses. Those are businesses that employ low-income folks. Um, and so we on West Lawn Gardens, for example, we are exceeding these minimum goals. We wanna do the same thing here in the near west side. Um, any residents that are interested in and skilled in the construction trades, there will be job opportunities. Um, we have a section three resident registry, which is an online registry where a resident can go online, certify that they are low income and put their um, information, including a copy of their resume on this registry. And our contractors work with that registry and we work th with it as well. And we help to link contractors to the qualified low income people, uh, depending on what the job is that they're hiring for. And so um, that's an opportunity that folks have. It's, it's not just for construction. We also use section three when we're hiring administrative assistants, office assistants. Um, or any other kinds of jobs, uh, case managers. But um, construction um, is also one of those areas. And so anybody, any residents that are interested in construction trades, we tell them about these opportunities. We wanna make sure they know about them and have those open to them, them if they want to and if, are qualified to work in construction. Next slide. So most of the people services are helping to link people to the supportive services that they need. Um, we start out, um, one of the main uh, parts of the transformation plan that the Near West Side has been working on is you know, determining what are the needs of the residents. Um, we have done a needs assessment survey at College Court. 
uh, back in 2017, 2018. And we are currently doing a, a needs assessment survey at Meadow Village as well to figure out what are the needs of the residents, um, you know, to hear from them what they have to say. Uh, we provide intensive case management and service coordination to individuals and families um, throughout the period of the grant. So that's one of the main things this, this comes with. And these case managers really help residents in a number of ways. They build this relationship with the resident and they really help them if there's employment needs that they have, if they've lost their job, if there are, um, if they need to get linked to healthcare services, if they need to get linked to childcare or, or early childhood education, any of these areas, um, case managers are there to assist them. Um, on employment strategies, we work with uh, partners in the neighborhood and also citywide. Um, this may include job training programs um, where we may be um, working to refer folks into job training in the areas that they're interested in. We work with them on job search. Uh, we even help them in terms of helping them on their resume, making sure that they, um, working with them on their interview skills. Um, so we really work to help those who are either unemployed or underemployed get into a career pathway uh, if we can. And we talk to them about the advantages of getting into jobs that have a clear career pathway. Um, we also work on asset building strategies. Um, Make Your Money Talk is a program that we have where we partner with the Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative Corporation. And that is a program that really teaches uh, financial education in a short session um, to low income individuals. And so um, they learn how to do a family budget, how to manage a checking account, how to manage their credit or improve their credit score. And that is really um, a tool that we use. When they complete that course, they are entitled to open up an individual development savings account, um, an IDA account, which for every dollar that they put in, it's matched two for one if they use it towards certain purchases, such as uh, buying a, their first home or starting a business or furthering post-secondary education. So that is something that we use to help residents A, build their household assets and B, really transform um, what they wanna do and look and, and improve how they deal with finances. Uh, we also wanna make sure um, that they're linked to healthcare. Um, well, we've done some of our surveys and most of our residents at College Court, for example, they're seniors and persons with disabilities. They're linked to, they have a doctor, a primary care doctor, but some of them still use emergency rooms as their, as their main point of entry. Um, and so we wanna work on that. Um, a number of folks don't have a link to a dentist. And so that's another area where there's a gap that we need to work on. So um, we wanna work with them to a, make sure that they understand what's available close by and B, get them connected to the services that they need. Next slide. Um, the Near West Side has also uh, been uh, very, um, working very intensely with Milwaukee Public Schools and with other schools, private schools in the area in the Near West Side um, on working on strategies that will help improve access to quality education. Um, there are a number of great schools in the Near West Side and a number of great early childhood education centers in the Near West Side. A lot of folks come from outside the neighborhood to go to those places. Um, we want to make sure that all the, uh, all the residents in the Near West Side understand um, what quality assets they have in the neighborhood. And if they want to take advantage of them, at least they have the knowledge of them and, and can have that access. Um, so that they can um, improve their children's lives um, by getting a quality education. We also um, have the possibility under this grant to create something called an endowment trust. And what that is, is using a small portion of the grant dollars to create a trust, an endowment um, that helps to fund services for the future. So this is a five-year grant. 
Uh, what happens when the grant ends? A lot of times everything stops because the grant is done. We wanna make sure that some, some level of small level of services uh, sustains this for the future. So that's another item that's built into the grant. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to turn it over back over to the Near West Side Partners to talk about neighborhood. Thanks, Ken. Um, so my name is Anna Weirich, and I am the Choice Neighborhood and Commercial Corridor Development Administrator with Near West Side Partners. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about some of the neighborhood projects that we are proposing to be a part of the Choice Neighborhood Grant. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so neighborhood improvement projects, um, these will benefit all residents of the near west side. Um, as Murphy and Ken have shared, the primary targets for the strategies in housing and in people are our public housing residents. Um, but with the neighborhood improvements, these are changes to the neighborhood that will help support um, everyone that lives here. Um, so one of the big questions, um, how did we come up with these projects that we're proposing? Um, so over the past couple years with the Choice Neighborhood Initiative Planning Grant, um, as well as before that with all the work that Near West Side Partners has done since their founding in 2014, um, we have been collecting information from surveys, focus groups, um, attending uh, neighborhood uh, association meetings um, and really just working with residents to identify um, the neighborhood assets that need to be improved in order to support everybody. Um, so our first project um, is to improve the retail offerings. Um, so we know that the near west side um, has seen a lot of great new businesses open up in the last five years, uh, particularly along the Leach Street. We've seen a lot of great work come in um, and some Great local businesses like Triciclo Peru um, and Pete's Pops open up along the Leet. Um, but we know that there's still a lot of areas of our neighborhood um, that have large stretches of vacant commercial properties. Um, so in order to help um, develop these spaces and get more local businesses into those uh, storefronts, um, we are going to be having a commercial facade grants program um, that will help uh, business owners and property owners to invest in the appearance of their property um, so that they can attract a great tenant, um, a local business that'll be ready to move in there. Um, but we also need to be able to support those small businesses that want to move into our community as well um, and providing business training and business boot camps for them, um, as well as continuing the Rev Up MKE program. Um, that we've really enjoyed um, over the past few years, that Shark Tank style competition that gives um, small business owners the opportunity to pitch their great business opportunity um, to a live audience. So um, we really wanna be able to support small businesses and improve the retail offerings, both from a facade standpoint uh, and improving the outside of the buildings, but also um, equipping small businesses with the supports they need. Uh, the second project that we are proposing is a streetscaping improvement. Um, so if you've driven down 27th Street lately, you've noticed the uh, plastic bollards and the painting on some of the intersections there. Um, these are all temporary. Uh, improvements to help traffic calming. Um, so to prevent people from driving in the passing lane or driving in the parking lane and really just slow down um, those streets so that we can have safer uh, pedestrian walkways um, and also be safer for all of our uh, drivers as well. Um, so we're looking to expand those efforts to other corridors as well as um, make them more permanent, um, actually building out the uh, intersections with concrete instead of just the painted um, curb extensions um, so that those can be permanent um, and really increase the safety for all of the near west side. The next project is a housing stabilization program. Um, so we know that in the near west side, uh, we have some of the oldest housing stock in, the, in all of Milwaukee. Um, and with that comes a lot of beauty, but also comes a lot of challenges on upkeep, uh, particularly for our low and middle income 
homeowners, um, where it does take some extra investment on those 100-year-old homes to maintain the porch and the siding um, and to do it all up to historic code and um, really just maintain these properties. Um, so we will be looking to distribute grants to homeowners um, that need help with the upkeep of their properties. Um, we think this will both help to keep people in the neighborhood um, and be able to help the current homeowners um, to stay in their homes, um, but it'll also help to attract new homeowners as the uh, homes are uh, quality is improved as well. And then last, we have a couple of placemaking projects. Um, so the first is the Hank Aaron State Trail entrance. Uh, so down at 33rd and Park Hill, um, there is an entrance to the Hank Aaron State Trail, um, but it's not well marked, it's not well lit. So a lot of people don't know about um, the great asset we have just south of the near west side, um, the wonderful bike trail there. Um, so we want to um, add some signage, add some lighting, add some art, um, and really show people the great connection between the near west side um, and this active trail for walking or biking or other physical activity um, that is just uh, below our southern border. And then last but certainly not least, um, one thing we hear from residents quite often is just the need for green space that is developed, um, especially for our multi-family units um, and for our families. Um, so as we have developed uh, the housing plans, we are also looking to identify spaces that we can have green space for our families to use. Um, so we will be looking to uh, develop a park, um, maybe along State Street where we're looking at some of the potential redevelopment sites. Um, and this would include a walking trail, uh, a playgrounds for the kids, as well as some picnic tables and maybe a gazebo. Um, really just a place for everyone to gather and spend some time outside. Um, so these are our, our projects we're proposing. We're still working with our partners um, to figure out the funding pieces as well as some of the fine-tuned details on how each of these uh, investments would happen. Um, but we're really excited about these and we'll be able to provide some more updates in the next couple weeks. Um, but next slide. And with that, Thank I'll you, turn Anna. it back over to Murphy. Great. Thank you, Anna. Um, so that's a, a bit about what is going on with housing, people, and neighborhood as we work on the Choice Neighborhoods Implementation um, Grant application. Again, do um, a little less than a month from now on December 16th. We do want to open this up to some discussion. You know, I've been doing this for longer than I care to admit, but about 23 years. And I would say prior to this year, we would be sitting uh, together in a community room having this discussion and conversation. We are all adapting to, um, to our, our need to be uh, distanced and healthy and safe. Uh, but we do want to have this discussion, so we're going to open that up in the ways that technology is allowing us to do it through the chat, through the questions and answers. But if we could go to the next slide, you know, there are a couple of things that have been on our mind um, and uh, on, on the, the, this slide uh, and the next one. If we leave it here, we know through conversations that we've had ongoing with College Court residents, that there are some College Court specific questions and concerns, and there will be and are some Meadow Village specific questions and concerns, and then there are our larger uh, neighborhood um, pieces of the conversation. So we know that at Meadow Village, this has come up a couple times in this presentation, just as we've talked today, that the need for accessibility, handicapped accessible physical improvements is important. The need for amenities and community space uh, is, is important as well as open space both at College Court and in the larger neighborhood. And then the costs of, the, of those things, that, uh, that new kind of um, energy, heating, air conditioning, plumbing, uh, that those utilities costs, um, that, that those are um, efficient systems and therefore affordable costs and then the overall affordability of the project 
and then the uh, the, the presence of, uh, of of that in the neighborhood. So we think about those as you could say what well, what in HUD lingo target site specific. So College Court and maybe Meadow Village specific. And then if we go to the next slide, we know that there are, and then the other lines on that last slide, sorry, are just you know fill in the blank. I'm sure that there are other um, concerns and that, that should be part of the discussion. Um, but then, then just sort of prompts of what are, what's on your mind for challenges and opportunities in the neighborhood. What, um, what kinds of uh, aspects of housing make it more livable in the near west side and generally. Um, and, and can we think of models of other kinds of neighborhoods or other aspects of other neighborhoods that help us um, craft that vision that is specific for the near west side? How does education play into all of this? How do transportation networks, either public transportation networks or other um, pandemic related solutions to transportation, um, commercial corridors, and obviously all tied to economic development. So those are just meant as kind of uh, prompts perhaps about uh, questions and discussion, um, but I'm gonna open it up and ask for, um, for a little bit of guidance or help in what might be going on in the chats and Q&A that we can all address. Marty, this is Lindsay. Um, we have a, a great question here from someone, and I think it kind of gets to the core of um, the development of our implementation grant. Why wouldn't HUD fund the redevelopment project since College Court is old and in need of capital improvements and lacks accessibility for the population it serves? Great question. Great question. And uh, and why wouldn't they? And I and so. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not HUD, but I, again, I have been doing this for a while. I will say like many things, it comes down to resources. So this is a competitive grant. This is competitive uh, um, application. They're not just handing out $35 million checks. There are cities and neighborhoods all over the country that are asking the same question. Why wouldn't they do that here for me and for, for uh, my citizens here? Um, so we are competing against, you know, probably a couple dozen, maybe even three dozen other cities that are asking for this $35 million grant. Um, and, uh, and as Lindsay pointed out at the beginning, there are only five available. So the power of our ideas, the power of our vision, the power of our partnerships to make this happen is what it the application is all about, um, in addition to checking lots of boxes uh, for, for HUD requirements. Uh, but the more compelling that is, the better our chance of winning this competition for $35 million. So why wouldn't they? They should. I think we're all probably in agreement that they should. Uh, we have to be better than the other guys. There are two questions that are um somewhat similar and I think really kind of get at um, what happens after a grant is awarded. Anna, you might be able to answer the first one. Uh, I think it's probably related to the housing stabilization um, program that you discussed. What is low income and what would you need to do to qualify for projects like that? Yes, so for our housing stabilization program, um, we are still looking at the qualifications for those uh, programs. Um, so one of the great things is that HUD really gives us a lot of leniency on what we set those program targets at. Um, so we are looking at the data of, um, you know, what is the median income of each neighborhood um, in the near west side, as well as what's the need um, for the housing stock. Um, so that's not something that we have those cutoffs established yet. Um, but are in the process of developing. Great. And uh, as long as uh, you are live, uh, will the bike trail along the railroad, railroad corridor be included in the plan, for example, with access at various places like the Galena Playground, which is just north of us? 
Yes, um, so I believe that's part of the root of the badger um, and is definitely something that we are um, working on, on connecting the root of the badger through the near west side um, and to the Hank Aaron State Trail. We do think that um, developing that area at um, 33rd and Park Hill will really kind of help to maybe bring those two together as well. Okay, and then one other question. This one might be a good one for um, Hackham. Um, if you are a housing developer or a neighborhood or a neighbor or maybe a neighbor who also works in housing development, how uh, would you get involved in the Choice Implementation Grant? Um, well, uh, if you are um, a neighbor who, was it just any neighbor? I believe this particular neighbor has uh, some housing experience. Okay, so um, we have right now a um, request for proposal out on the street um, for individual, for um, owners uh, or properties that are interested, developers that are interested in um, project-based vouchers. That is one way. Another way is as we move forward, and Murphy may want to touch on this, there may be other opportunities um, for additional work in the neighborhood um, on housing. Murphy, did you want to touch on any of that? Well, so, so if we think back to, yes, thank you, Ken. If we think back to sort of those clusters of development or even that slide with the large map that there are lots of other uh, of opportunities that we might have identified. And I think even in addition to that, I'm sure that, that there are others. So as we craft the plan, uh, we are trying to work to identify those and again, expand it as much as, as possible. We would welcome any conversation about development opportunities um, in partnership. And so we should make that happen um, as, uh, as quickly as possible and as easily as possible. I would say that could happen through contacts here, through Near West Side, uh, through me, happy to do it. But it also comes back to something we've said a couple times, um, the, the choice neighborhoods boxes fitting in the HUD, the HUD uh, piece. So we need to make sure that it works in the federal procurement kind of rules, that those development partnerships that we're trying to do as much as possible, that we can get those to fit um, in the HUD box and, uh, and the development procurement, but we need to have those conversations and are open to having those conversations. Uh, again, as soon as possible. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Murphy. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we're wrapping up in just shy of an hour um, on our questions and discussions here. If you did have a question that was not answered, uh, we will be sure to follow up. And if you have any additional questions following this, I do encourage you to connect with Anna Wyrick, who is leading the charge here at Near West Side. Um, her email address is ccc at nearwestsidepartners.org. Thanks again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next week.